Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have an exciting presentation for you from uh, RAD. And uh, my colleague Cody is going to do a quick introduction to, um, to the presenter. Uh, just a few housekeeping um, notes. Everyone will be on mute during the webinar. So um, if you speak, we won't hear you. But if you do have any questions, the uh, GoToWebinar console has a, a little um, box there where you can type them in. And uh, we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm also recording this webinar, so if you do have to leave or you want to share it with someone else, after uh, a couple of days after the presentation, we'll be sending you a link to the video. So without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Cody. And uh, thank you for joining us. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we do, as Lisa said, we, we do really appreciate uh, taking the time to join us today. Uh, very exciting presentation. I've been lucky enough to sit in on a few of these uh, with RAD uh, throughout the years, and they are always uh, very informative and um, very well done. Uh, today we're going to have uh, Dave Thomas. Uh, he's a VP of uh, Critical Infrastructure with RAD, based out of Nashville, Music City. Uh, he he has uh, he's been with Rad a bit a little over a year now, but uh, has many years uh, experience in the industry. I'm just going to do a quick overview of Alliance Corporation and what we do before I pass it on to Dave. Just for anybody who might not be familiar with us, uh, basically Alliance Corporation we are a value add wireless uh, distributor. Uh, so we, we've, we do pretty much anything telecom, uh, a lot of wireless products, uh, indoor and outdoor DAS solutions, uh, supply chain solutions, which I'll get into on, on another slide coming up here. Everything on the infrastructure side, uh, we're very deep, deeply embedded with, uh, with the major carriers throughout Canada and the U.S. Uh, we also have two uh, clean rooms. Uh, for, for custom fiber solutions. Uh, one is in Mexico, uh, one is in um, Mississauga, Ontario. We, this, is, this is a very strong part of what Alliance can bring to the table. Uh, basically, any, anything fiber, we can take a, a customized solution and, and rather than it taking 12 weeks to get out the door, we can typically get something out you know, three to four weeks, something uh, uh, a lot of our uh, competitors or manufacturers are not able to do. As I said before, uh, we are a uh, leading distributor of wireless infrastructure products, um, supply chain solutions strictly focused on wireless. Uh, we have a world-class product assortment. Uh, we always make sure we get the, the best that is, is offered. Uh, extensive inventory, and that is throughout Canada, uh, the U.S., and Mexico. Uh, we have a very strong sales team, uh, many, many years from industry veterans. Uh, basically, we, we pretty much have an expert in any area of uh, telecom that, that you can find. Uh, tech support and training uh, programs are something that we are also very involved in. Uh, we can do anything from, you know, we can have a training session in your own boardroom, or we can have an open session where we invite uh, multiple end users and partners to join us. And as I mentioned, warehouses throughout Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Uh, something Alliance can bring to the table. Uh, technical services, uh, microwave path licensing. Uh, we can take that and work with Industry Canada and get all that done for you. Network design, uh, radio path surveys, product pre-configuration. If you need software licenses, firmware, etc., loaded on a radio before it goes out to site, we can do that. Uh, custom kitting is a big thing that we do as well. We can, uh, we can have uh, a site completely ready for turnkey um, as soon as it arrives. Tower design, we, we're very strong in that area. Uh, tier 1 and 2 technical support as well um, in-house in here at Alliance, uh, as well as uh, helping out with RMAs. Uh, here, here's just a, an overview of our comprehensive best-in-class broadband solutions. Uh, we believe it is best-in-class. Uh, um, see a, a few of our partners listed there, everything from backhaul to uh, transport systems, point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint. Licensed, unlicensed frequencies, mesh, outdoor Wi-Fi, towers, and uh, another thing we do is the is the power as well, the AC DC uh, backup battery power as well. So uh, with that, I'm just going to say, Lisa, Lisa did mention that if you do have to pop out, 
Uh, we are recording this. We have a YouTube channel. I highly recommend uh, subscribing to it. We run different webinars, uh, training, all, all sorts of things throughout the year. Uh, and, they, and Lisa does post them all on, on our uh, YouTube page. Again, I'm Cody Cochran. I'm based out of Western Canada. Uh, my information is on the screen there. If, uh, if, if you don't fall into my territory and you have questions, concerns, anything, we will make sure that you get hooked up with your appropriate salesperson. Um, visit our YouTube channel, follow us, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Always uh, encourage our, our customers to, to get involved with us on social media. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave um, to, to start the presentation. So thanks, guys. Uh, hello, guys. I, uh, I hope everybody hears me okay. Uh, but uh, again, thanks for Alliance for setting this up, and uh, uh, hopefully, we'll uh, we're going to provide you guys with some very useful information today on on Red products, and then how we uh, how we use those products specifically uh, for cybersecurity. Uh, just a little for you guys that don't know a lot about RAD. Uh, I mean, basically, RAD was uh, founded in 1981. Uh, we're uh, uh, the the RAD Inc. business in uh, North America is the anchor of the RAD Group, which is about a 1.2 billion a year corporation. Uh, we have 31 offices uh, uh, around the world, plus sales channels in more than 150 different countries, and about 4,500 employees. Uh, what we offer to power utilities uh, means we, we basically provide uh, multi-service uh, substation multiplexers, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about those products and what they do uh, and why they're important. Uh, we'll, we also do uh, uh, 61850 uh, hardened uh, substation uh, networking products, so uh, switches and routers, uh, pro SCADA protocol converters, SCADA firewalls that are 61850 compliant. Uh, we support different uh, distance and differential uh, protective relaying schemes over our, our multiplexer product uh, with very low latency, lowest latency in the industry for uh, packet switch networks, so sub two milliseconds. And then we have products that are specifically designed to do distribution automation and uh, meter backhaul. So kind of what RED's, uh, what RED's solution looks like. Uh, I mean, basically, we provide the operational wide area network. We do that at both uh, uh, carrier-grade Ethernet at 1 and 10 gigabits, uh, or SONNET at OC3, OC12 rates. Uh, again, 61850 substation uh, hardened uh, local, uh, local area networking products, so uh, layer 2 and layer 3 devices. Uh, Multi-service MUX, so uh, the, uh, we, we provide a product that can bring in uh, Existing legacy interfaces that that power utilities support today for SCADA, teleprotection, IEDs, uh, and uh, again, uh, teleprotection connectivity at, at very low uh, latency, even over uh, over carrier Ethernet. Uh, we do also do traffic duplication, so we can provide this both over uh, 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 carrier Ethernet or SONNET, and we can actually do both simultaneously. So we have a product that would allow a, a utility to transmit some traffic over SONNET, some over Ethernet, or traffic over both SONNET and Ethernet as they as they transition from one technology to the other. And then uh, smart meter backhaul, uh, distribution automation, uh, and then probably one of the most important tools or products that we provide is a network management system that manages all of this. And our network manager is GUI-based. Uh, uh, we just launched our, our service manager, which gives end-to-end -end provisioning. So it makes it simple simple for power utilities to provision and set up services over our products because they're point-click, GUI-based uh, 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 system based on wizards. So they basically walks them through how to, uh, to provision traffic. So just kind of a quick view of what they all look like. Uh, I mean, some of the products that some of you guys may be familiar, some may not, but uh, our Megaplex 4 platform is the multi-service uh, access platform. It's also the platform that we support teleprotection on. Uh, SecFlow, uh, is, we, we uh, promote it primarily as a uh, meter backhaul and distribution automation. Uh, Airmux is our uh, high-capacity uh, sub-6 gigahertz uh, wireless product line. 
and then ETX is a, our multi-service uh, 10 gig platform for core networks. And then again at the bottom you can see RevView Network Manager. So basically we, we provide a tool to manage all of these products. So if you look at the Megaplex, we'll go through the products real quick and some of the features. And I won't bore you a lot with uh, speeds and feeds and, and technical data, but the Megaplex, uh, basically it's a 10, 100, 1 gigabit carrier Ethernet certified multiplexer. Uh, it supports analog and digital voice circuits, so the old standard old two-wire, four-wire uh, uh, pot circuits that uh, a lot of you guys are accustomed to, we still support, we're still able to support those. Uh, we do uh, uh, network virtualization. Uh, so we have a, a, an interface card that plugs into our multiplexer that would allow you to do virtual applications like firewall, router, etc. cetera. Uh, traffic duplication, uh, relay and alarms, network management, uh, SYNC-E, but, and also IEEE 1588 per, per, uh, precision timing protocol. So this is very important to power utilities, especially those, the large uh, uh, hydros and in Canada where they're doing a lot of synchrophaser applications. Uh, 1588 is a sub millisecond accuracy timing protocol and we, we were able to support that. Uh, sub 50 millisecond restoration, so if they take a fiber cut and their network's configured in rings, we can restore traffic in less than uh, 50 milliseconds. And then that less than 50 milliseconds is regardless of whether it's carrier or ethernet or sonic. Uh, digital cross connect, uh, sub two millisecond latency on teleprotection, and and for you guys that aren't teleprotection engineers are familiar with that, but protective relaying is kind of the core of what power utilities do, or probably the most important function that power utilities do. I mean, this is what protects the transmission lines and substations and helps keep the power on. And latency uh, uh, in this application is, is very, very critical, very important, and we're able to support uh, that at sub two millisecond rate. So, uh, uh, and that's in for, for, a, for a packet switch product, that's no one in the industry comes close to that. Uh, serial SCADA, and then uh, N by 64 uh, kilobit to OC12 TDM circuit, so we could support T1 uh, uh, or N by 64, N by 64 all the way up T1, OC3, and OC12 uh, for TDM uplink. And then power over Ethernet. Uh, the SecFlow product this is the product that we use for. Uh, a metering backhaul and uh, distribution automation. Uh, again, it's 61850-3. That's an IEC, an international standard, and it's certified to meet that standard. And that's standards for both temperature and and uh, uh, various electrical uh, electrical standards that it's required to meet. Uh, it's a layer two switch, also a layer three router. Uh, it has serial interfaces, so it can support RS-232 uh, or RS-485. Uh, it does SCADA protocol conversion. Uh, it supports all the popular uh, SCADA protocols used in the in the power utility industry. Here in North America, that's primarily DNB, uh, though we do see some Modbus, and occasionally you'll see the IEC 104 uh, uh, protocol used, but typically it's DNP, and uh, with DNP3 being the most current version, but sometimes Modbus, some utilities support Modbus. Uh, it has a terminal server function, very, very important function for security. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but when power utilities are trying to protect uh, a critical cyber asset uh, and, they, and, and uh, uh, you're doing what NERC defines as an interactive remote access session, having this terminal server function uh, is pretty important because now it allows you to do authentication, uh, it'll support uh, uh, the common authentication things like radius and et cetera, right? So you can, you, it's more than just a password. It, you know, now it's a, a password plus something that you have, which could be your fingerprint, your uh, a retina scan, or a random number generator. A lot of us are familiar with the token, the key tokens that are used uh, uh, that are used for uh, uh, for radius. Uh, it's a, it can also be uh, worked over 2G, 3G, or uh, LTE. Uh, it'll support fiber optic rings, G.8032 standard for fiber optic rings. So again, sub 50 millisecond protection switching. Uh, again, layer two, layer three VPNs, uh, power over ethernet, an important feature, especially when you get into some applications like this, if you're using surveillance cameras or radios that can be powered over an ethernet port 
this can be the uh, the power source for those. Uh, another important one is the IEEE 1588 precision timing protocol. Uh, and then SCADA firewall. So, uh, and a lot of utilities are looking at this product specifically for this function. So it can do uh, deep packet inspection for uh, DMP and Modbus uh, SCADA protocols. It can also do intrusion detection. So it can be, uh, it has, we have a software tool that comes with this that uh, will help you with intrusion detection. So if someone starts to hack, tries to hack your SCADA system, then there's a, the system in place to detect that and alarm and, uh, and it can take whatever action you program into it to uh, perform when it does detect intrusion. The Aramux product, uh, again, it's sub six gigahertz. Uh, so basically the, uh, the two gig up to uh, six gig uh, licensed and unlicensed bands. Uh, point to point, point to multi point. Uh, it can provide up to 250 megabits of throughput. Uh, we provide a, a very nice uh, wireless RF planning tool that's uh, uh, free to use when you buy the product. Uh, uh, it does have network and performance management tools. Uh, supports all the standards. Probably the important one there is NEMO. Uh, broadband mobility and broadband mobility at 250 kilometers per hour. So we do a lot of mobility projects for the high-speed rail trains in Europe, and uh, and being able to send high-speed data to a train moving at a couple hundred kilometers is not a simple task, but we're able to accomplish that and uh, and provide and guarantee it up at up to speeds of 250 kilometers per hour. Uh, long wide range coverage. Uh, again, the, we talked about the mobility application for rail and highway. Uh, we can do guaranteed bandwidth and bandwidth and uh, and you're, we also give you a, the capability of set, setting up SLAs for specific applications or customers that are on the product. So you can guarantee bandwidth uh, for a specific application or a customer. And then very low, very low latency, very and uh, low jitter. Uh, and then we support native Ethernet, and then also TDM. Uh, we can provide direct interfaces for T1 channel things. Uh, the ETX product, uh, very highly resilient, available product. Uh, various topologies are important, so point-to-point, -point mesh, uh, linear, uh, self-healing carrier Ethernet rings. Uh, it's compact, 3U. Uh, high, uh, supports uh, 1588. It can be a 1588 Grandmaster. Uh, Again, up to 10 gigabit uh, carrier Ethernet support, and then uh, it's uh, uh, just like the Megaplex. It's CE 2.0 certified, so it's certified by MEP to meet the carrier Ethernet standard, which is important uh, to your customers and uh, and to you get to your end users out there that it is a, a standard-based product. And then our network management software, so it does performance monitoring. It's an element and a network management uh, package. Uh, very high, high availability and disaster recovery, uh, zero touch provisioning. So again, you can point, click, and uh, and provision circuits. So very simple to use. So you don't have to have a lot of uh, uh, training or, or be uh, very confident. It's that things like command line, that kind of stuff. It means a simple point, click, GUI based uh, management. Uh, secure access. Uh, it's user friendly. Uh, point and click. We already brought up, and then. It also allows you to do uh, service creation and testing uh, per the Y.1731 standard. So now let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity and some of the stuff uh, uh, that's kind of important. And uh, and you know, I, I occasionally when I talk to a lot of uh, occasionally when I talk to Canadians, they automatically say, "Hey, it's uh, uh, we're not we're Canadian. We don't we don't have to comply with NERC." But they uh, they they don't realize that in most cases they actually do, and and so uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that and a little bit more about that and what it means. But but essentially, cyber threats for uh, uh, critical infrastructure in North America is a is a is a real issue. Uh, I think we all have heard enough and seen enough, and and we you know we've heard of things like Stuxnet and hackers trying to threaten power companies, et cetera. So all you have to do is pick up the newspaper. And you hear, you know, uh, uh, story after story about things going on. Uh, you know, the, uh, the head of uh, uh, Homeland Security and uh, basically, you know, has come out and said that China could use it, China is actively uh, uh, sponsoring attacks on our infrastructure, and uh, it could be, you know, basically the next major. Uh, uh, 
weapon of war, right? So, I mean, what the best, what's the better way to threaten uh, uh, North America, both U.S. and Canada, than to, than to threaten our infrastructure, right? So our water, our power, our oil and gas supplies, I mean, if they, those come under attack, uh, it could be devastating to our economy and also our way of life. Uh, outside of North America, uh, you know, there's basically this very similar uh, activities going on. Uh, the European Union uh, uh, set up uh, basically a NISA, and a NISA, if you look at the NISA standards, uh, they look very much like the NERC SIP standards, and we'll talk about NERC SIP and what all this stuff means, and give you a little bit of, of information and what some of all the acronyms are, because when you get to, when you dive into NERC SIP, you get a whole new uh, dose of acronyms. Trust me, but we see uh, uh, ANISA popping up in RFPs in Australia, France, Italy. So uh, uh, cybersecurity is something that's uh, uh, essentially a worldwide uh, a worldwide issue. And then and then the trends in the market. I mean, we see companies like Fortinet, Fortinet and Checkpoint, who are a large uh, firewall companies and traditional firewall companies providing firewalls for banks and industry. Uh, now they're provide now they're announcing products for SCADA aware firewalls. Uh, we see power utilities like ERDF in France, uh, where we're actually doing a study with them with our SecPro product using our SCADA firewall. Uh, uh, Central Electric in the U.S. doing very similar application, essentially doing a distributed SCADA firewall and using le uh, legacy Ethernet over Sonic, but using our our uh, SecPro product as the firewall. Uh, Anel in Italy, Italy, which is the the, the countrywide uh, utility there. I mean, essentially the same thing. And uh, basically, uh, today, RAD has about six uh, SCADA firewall projects going on in North America that we just began in the last, basically this year, right? So, uh, uh, you know, the awareness of security and the awareness of cybersecurity in the, in, in the power utility industry is, power utility industry is very, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's here today and, and something that we're all having to deal with. So what is NERC SIP? Uh, so SIP stands for Critical Infrastructure Protection. Uh, NERC, uh, I think most of you probably know, but it's the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. And the important thing there is North American, meaning North America is in Canada and the U.S. Now there, there is a little bit of a caveat to that. Quebec, it doesn't, can't be fined by NERC. And, uh, but neither can Manitoba. The rest of the provinces can. Uh, but, uh, uh, and some of you might find humor in that, or maybe not. I don't know. But anyway, I'm, I'm an American from Tennessee, so I, I, I don't, I don't, I stay out of the Canadian politics. But uh, either way, uh, uh, since most of the major hydros in, in Canada uh, deliver power into the U.S. and they rely on that power delivery as a large part of their revenue, uh, one of the things that most of the utilities in the U.S. require. Uh, the Canadian Hydro to do is uh, uh, agree to uh, apply our, uh, 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 comply with NERC uh, requirements, including NERC SIP. <clears throat> so uh, currently today we're in version five of NERC SIP, and uh, uh, that's the that's the at least the version that that is in effect that can be uh, uh, that utilities can be uh, audited to. Uh, it deals with what's defined as the BES or bulk electric system, which is Basically, a very simple. It's defined as anything above 100 kV. It gives a bill, uh, NERC the ability to conduct annual compliance tests, and they can impose fi uh, fines starting in Q2 of next year if they find you not compliant. Uh, and then version six uh, is planned for 2017. And actually, I, I could probably I need to update the slide because technically they've decided that they're going to roll version seven and six together, but Essentially, version six and seven will deal with below 100 kV, what they define as transient devices, which is, entails a lot of stuff. But essentially, as we as we as we move forward in years, NERC starts to reach deeper and deeper into the power delivery system, and uh, uh, and, and actually, there's already plans in in uh, version eight and standards that are being written for meter backhaul, distribution automation, things like that. So uh, uh, as we go forward, it won't just be everything above 100 kV is what they're worried about. They're actually going to be standards for cybersecurity all the way down to the meter on the side of your house. Uh, if you look at the NERC SIP guidelines, they look kind of like this. This is actually just a snapshot of uh, 
uh, of the front page. But the things that we're we're most consider are most interested in are are what's considered uh, 002, 005, and 007. And two basically defines what critical cyber assets are. Uh, 005 defines what they uh, uh, call an electronic security perimeter. We'll talk. We'll explain. I'll explain what that means. And then seven talks about system security management. And basically, that's the uh, the, the things that that have to be done, right? And then you can look at some of the others. So it's physical security and incident reporting, recovery plans. I mean, there's a lot more in NERC SIP than just cybersecurity. It's actual physical security of a substation or, or the cyber assets, so a power plant, an energy control center, a substation, et cetera, right? So <clears throat> I promised I'd, uh, uh, I'd give you uh, uh, a break on some of the acronyms and kind of go through them because there's a lot of them when you start looking at the NERC SIP. I mean, the first is the BES, which is the bulk electric system. And you'll if you set it in on any of these seminars or or if you go and need to, to any of the classes on NERC SIP, uh, you're going to get inundated with this stuff. But when you hear people talk about BES, they're talking about the bulk electric system. And basically today that means 100 kV or higher. Uh, you'll hear BCS, which is bulk electric system cyber systems. And uh, basically what that is is a, a group cyber assets uh, that form a system. Uh, you'll hear BCA, which are cyber assets, which are which is interesting, and it's actually the this the what's on the screen here is actually right straight out of the NERC SIP uh, uh, document. But basically, a cyber asset is a pro programmable electronic device, including the hardware and software and data in those devices that are critical for electric supply reliability. That can be accessed via routable protocol. Uh, and then ESP, which is the electronic security perimeter. Oh, and finally, we'll talk a little bit more about routable protocol, what that means. And where, in the case of uh, high-risk cyber assets, it doesn't even matter if it's accessed via routable protocol. There's there's actually requirements for uh, uh, high-impact uh, cyber assets. But again, electronic electronic uh, security perimeter, and basically the way to think of that is it's kind of an imaginary line around the cyber assets and cyber systems, and uh, uh, essentially it would be, you know, what systems you have in place, firewalls, encryption, things like that, that protect those cyber assets that are being accessed from outside the, uh, the substation. Uh, another one is uh, the BROS, or BROS, uh, which is uh, the Bulk Electric System Reliability Operating Service. And that's I know it's a mouthful, but essentially that's uh, cyber assets that perform a function that essentially create a reliability process, so it's kind of an interesting, uh, uh, interesting term. But utilities are required to identify these. Uh, you'll hear a lot of utilities talk about doing bottom up or top down, and it's pretty simple, right? Bottom up just mean, just means that they defined all their cyber assets, then cyber systems, and then their bulk reliability operating services. If you go top down, you just essentially go from the top and work your way down, but Essentially, in NERC, what what they what they require the utility to do is define all these things. So you have to you have to define uh, what the cyber assets are, where they're at, what they are, what kind of communications you're using to access them, and the same thing with cyber uh, systems. The same thing with uh, reliability operating services. Uh, NERC uses a few terms uh, that are that are pretty uh, uh, they're pretty that at least I find pretty interesting. They use the word programmable a lot. And the and the ter and the, the term affect the reliable operation of the BES. Uh, they don't really define what programmable means, nor what affect the reliable operation of the BES means. So what they're what they're really forcing power utilities to do is to start to use common sense, and uh, uh, and define what's what's out there, what could be affected, what would be important to them if it was affected, and then start to put measures in place to protect those. And then obviously you have to, they have to they have to list every facility and asset, whether it's medium impact or low impact or high impact. I mean that all has to be defined and, and in NERC SIP there's standards for how you do that. And when you're audited, you have to have physical doc, documentation to prove that you've defined and, and uh, uh, classified all, all these things. So our external routable connectivity, us as telecom guys, I mean this this is kind of probably important to us, but Essentially, uh, it's pretty it's pretty uh, uh, it's pretty straightforward. 
I mean, a routable, proto routable protocol, at least in NERC, is anything that employs a uh, physical address like a MAC address or a and a network address like an IP address. Uh, so one of the things you can, one of the things you can you probably start to pick up on real quick as well. So maybe this is why RED uses carrier Ethernet because we don't need an IP address, and it is why we we use carrier Ethernet and believe that carrier Ethernet, being a later layer two protocol protocol with only a MAC address, no uh, IP address, is. Uh, uh, Better for power utilities, and especially better for power utilities when it comes to cybersecurity. And it's part of why, uh, if you look at even in the carrier industry, you'll find that carrier Ethernet is typically used at the edge of uh, carrier networks, and especially in banking and corporate networks where cybersecurity is important. Uh, also, uh, one of the things is uh, just because uh, uh, you're using a TDM network like Sonnet or T1, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get out of the ERC, especially if you use protocol converters that have IP addresses. So uh, one of the things that NERC warns is uh, uh, TDM is an automatic uh, uh, get out of jail pass or get out of jail free pass, right? Uh, once you have uh, ERC, or so you've identified an asset, it's a medium or a high impact cyber asset, and it has externally routable connectivity. Uh, now you have to understand what the implications are and you know in version five in SIP version five and even beyond, right? And one of the important things is man in the middle attack and NERC talks a lot about this. So uh, they they you know I think a lot of us when we first think of cybersecurity and uh, and protecting the, the critical infrastructure we think about you know, hackers in basements in North Korea or Russia or whatever trying to hack into the network. But the reality is, is the hack could come from someone inside the power utility, even someone that might be considered trusted, right? So now systems have to be in place that protect against man-in-the-middle attacks and friendly attacks. Uh, also, replay attacks, that's one of the, uh, 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 the common ways to hack networks or disrupt networks is simply just to record packets going across the network and they just keep replaying them. Uh, and we'll talk about how how we protect against that and uh, uh, you know give the utilities a, a way to be compliant. And then uh, uh, all network nodes uh, between the ESP, the electronic security perimeter, and each electronic security perimeter, by the way, has an EAP. And there's another new uh, uh, acronym, but an EAP is electronic access point, and that has to be identified. So an ESP has an e, has EAP or could have EAPs. There could be multiple access points to the electronic security perimeter. But uh, uh, but all the nodes that are all the uh, nodes that, that communicate between the ESP and uh, cyber assets, such as a control center, as well as all the cabling. You know, it, all of this is now has to be potentially suspect as possibly being compromised or or could be compromised. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the real simple mechanisms that are out there today that we use in other industries today that can protect that, things like MACSEC and IPSEC and, uh, and what they mean, right? So the electronic security perimeter. So basically what NERCSEC says is the responsible entity shall ensure that every critical cyber asset resides within an ESP, electronic security perimeter. And then you have to identify and document the perimeter, and then document all the access points. So, and again, if you have multiple devices with different communications methods going out of the ESP, you can have multiple access points. If you had a one single multiplexer, you might only have one access point, but you could have one, at least one, or multiple, right? So this all has to be identified. And essentially, this is what kind of what it would look like. So it's the the black line around the substation is kind of that imaginary electronic security perimeter, and then there's an access point you can see pointed to the yellow point with the you can see the multiplexer pointed in sitting in there. So that basically becomes your access point. So that has to be identified. And then just kind of a quick look at what it looks like. But essentially, that access point is going to fall inside usually a substation control room, and there's where all your communications equipment. Uh, the intelligent electronic devices, the RTUs for SCADA, teleprotection relays, et cetera, all that's going to be uh, uh, located inside uh, and next to that electronic access point. <clears throat> so 
cyber protection and, and protecting IEDs from unauthorized sources, right? So what does it mean, right? So it's important that all messages to and from a substation are genuine and they're sent from an authorized source and they do not carry, carry any malware. So essentially what power utilities are, are being forced to do is make sure that they authenticate every all the information or all the traffic coming in and out of the substation. They authorize that it's coming, the source, the, 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 the location it's coming from is authorized. I mean, so they, they authenticate that that uh, location or that the person accessing information is uh, uh, authorized. And then they also need a way to make sure that the information coming back and forth is safe, you know, so it doesn't contain any malware. Uh, the messages must be communicated securely, and their integrity has to be properly reconfirmed. So they talk about integrity, and specifically about integrity being or integrity and security, or securely being things like encryption and authentication. And then uh, we have to protect all the uh, uh, intelligent devices in there from unauthorized access. I mean, today, you know, I mean, if you walk into a substation. Most of the devices in there are, program, are definitely going to follow the programmable category. They're all smart. They all can be reprogrammed or, or settings changed so that they would function in a different way or an unexpected way. So all these devices have to be protected. So what RAD provides or what our solution is today, and we're, we're, we're going to a little detail on this stuff, is, uh, sorry, let me back up here. Uh, so we do encryption and integrity. Uh, we provide application aware, specifically SCADA aware firewalls, and we provide, provide provide a solution that does distributed firewalls, so each substation can have its own firewall. Uh, we log and uh, basically create a record using using standards like Syslog of all connection events. So when we say connection events, so this means every time a a port is accessed, or we are a port sends traffic, or someone goes in and change changes the settings on a port, or ports turned on, or ports turned off. We log that information, and uh, uh, we also record and monitor. This is one of the things that's in NERCSIP is you have to identify every connection, whether it's used or not. So every time, every Ethernet port, USB port, serial connection that's in that substation has to be logged, and has to, you have to be ready to basically show that information in a NERCSIP audit. And, uh, and you also have to monitor it. So if it changes, you have to know it changed. You have to uh, document the change and then go out and figure out whether that was an authorized change, an unauthorized change, et cetera, right? But all that has to be done, and RED provides products and solutions that, that address all of these. So if you look at uh, 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 our product today, right? I mean, so the Megaplex product. Uh, so we provide device connection control using 802.1x. So basically network access control. Uh, we provide SCADA aware firewalls, uh, uh, intrusion protection systems, specifically intrusion detection systems and anomaly detection systems. So if something happens or something occurs that isn't expected, we have a we have a, a product in, uh, we have a firewall in place that will actually identify that and then can take action based on how you set it. So it could be as simple as if we detect an anomaly or detect an intrusion on a SCADA firewall, and we can you can literally say, okay, the minute you detect that, turn the port off. So we cease communications with the SCADA fire, with the SCADA RTU, and then set off an alarm that uh, an intrusion has been detected. Uh, we also prevent man-in-the-middle uh, attacks using MaxSec encryption and integrity. And we'll talk a little more about MaxSec and why it's important. But you know, for those of you who don't know, MaxSec, you know, does a uh, 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 256 bit uh, encryption, so very strong encryption, virtually unbreakable. Uh, it does uh, uh, it authenticates every user and it authenticates every location, and and so the, it does integrity checks on on not just the user but also the location. And then it all it numbers every packet. So if someone attempts to do replays, you know if the packet uh, numbers are have already been used, then the system knows that it throws away packets. So it protects against uh, uh, replay attacks. If you look at the SecFlow, the uh, the product that's uh, that we use for uh, uh, meter backhaul and distribution automation, essentially it does the same thing, uh, provides the same provides provides the same kind of security, with exception it uses IPsec for encryption, and that's because it uses IPsec simply because it's a layer three device. MacSec wouldn't be supported in that case. 
uh, and, but essentially gives you the same kind of protection that MaxSec does. And the really the only real difference, or the only real significant difference between MaxSec and IPSec, and I think I'll talk a little later in another slide about it, but essentially MaxSec is hardware based, so it's very low latency. It only adds, uh, 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 in the case of our Megaflex product, about eight microseconds of additional delay to the entire payload when encrypting the entire payload, whereas IPSec can have ten, tens of milliseconds to delay, uh, additional delay. So that could be something that wouldn't be too desirable for teleprotection, IPSec, but MaxSec is perfect. So uh, 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 so we use MaxSec in the in the substation multi uh, uh, multi service access MUX, and we use IPSec in the uh, metering backhaul and uh, uh, distribution automation product. Uh, also, uh, just a kind of a quick one on our virtualization. Uh, essentially, uh, it gives us the ability to add tons of new services. Uh, I mean, almost the sky's the limit. I mean, uh, our virtualization card is as simple as it's very simple. It's a, a an x86 processor on a card that plugs into the MUX. Uh, it can interact with the backplane, so it interacts directly with the traffic on the multiplexer, and uh, essentially it has a, uh, a solid state drive and uh, runs on uh, uh, Linux, so uh, you can do things like SCADA firewalls, anomaly detection, terminal server, router, uh, do protocol conversions for SCADA RTUs. Uh, it could actually be a SCADA RTU for that matter, right? So so the kind of the sky's the limit when it gets to, to virtualization, but our, our multi-service product, Megaplex, does have this, multi, uh, this uh, network virtualization feature and built into it in the form of a plug-in channel card so uh, uh, we kind of we kind of give the customer a little bit of future proofing going forward because you know again that's just simply a, it's a software tool or a software feature. So whatever you can do on software, we can plug it on that card and uh, and run it in the multiplexer. And today we're working with companies like Fortinet and Checkpoint and uh, uh, HP, etc., uh, doing exactly that. Right. So we're we're already. Uh, uh, testing and uh, certifying buying their firewall products to uh, to operate on this card. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit. This is a, a, a little bit about SCADA uh, and uh, what the requirement in NERC SIP. And if you look at the table, it's actually SIP uh, 005-5. So uh, what basically what it says is uh, uh, the applicable system. So if you have an electronic access point for a high impact uh, cyber system or an elect elect uh, electronic access point for a medium impact cyber system, and specifically at a control center, then uh, you have to have one or more methods of detecting known or suspected malicious communications. And then if you look over to the right, it says measures of that would be an example of evidence may include is not limited to documentation of mali malicious communication detection methods. In other words, intrusion detection systems, application la layer firewalls, etc., are implemented. So essentially what NERC is saying is that when your systems that are defined over here, uh, uh, as defined over here, are required to have some method of malicious communications detection, and those being things like application layer firewalls, uh, that's a requirement, right? So that so going forward, so if you've got a SCADA, if you've got a SCADA RTU at a high impact and part of a high impact substation, and it's communicating back to an RTU at a control center, then that, that communications needs to be firewalled. And we provide those firewalls either in our multi-service platform or in our uh, uh, the small form factor device that we use for automation or, or specifically uh, uh, firewall application. So device connection control, uh, again, same thing, and I won't bore you too much with reading too much out of these tables, but again, you, you can get this presentation and read it yourself, I guess. but. Essentially, it defines the system, so the high-impact systems that are defined and the medium-impact systems and how they're defined. And basically, for technically uh, feasible, you have to enable only logical network access ports. Uh, and, and again, what that paragraph basically is saying is that uh, if you've got a device that fits one of these applicable systems and say it has four Ethernet ports or two Ethernet ports and a USB port, so you have to... Uh, enable only the ports that you need. So if you're only using one of those Ethernet ports to communicate, then they want the other Ethernet port to be disabled. And if you're not using that USB port, if it's only there for reprogramming or 
our, our maintenance or whatever, it should be turned off as well, right? Now they do give, they do actually give, uh, give you a little bit of a, a break on medium impact if you can't turn them off. Uh, if the manufacturer's equipment does, didn't offer a way to turn them off, then you can you can all you have to do is identify them and document it. And uh, uh, at least for this point, at least for this time, it's good, right? So essentially, what the what the point of this is though is to have utilities identify all these ports that allow communication to these systems, and especially systems where you can program or reprogram, change settings. You have to identify all those ports. You have to only enable the ports that, that are needed, disable the ports that aren't needed, and then you have to monitor all those going forward. And it kind of looks like this. I mean, this is a, it's not a real good screenshot, but this is a screenshot of a software product that we're looking, that we're testing right now to run on our NFD car, car essentially it's a product called Port Knox. And what it does is it actually, it, it actually sniffs the network and finds all the different devices out there, identifies all the ports, and uh, tells you which ports are on, which ports are off, monitors them. If a port's set to be off, all of a sudden it gets turned on. Obviously, it would raise an alarm, et cetera, right? But essentially, that product would do this monitoring, this uh, identification and monitoring for you. But at a minimum, what, what NERC SIP requires today is that everyone has to, uh, has to do this on their own, right? And, or at least physically document it. Uh, whether it's on a piece of paper or a spreadsheet or it's in some kind of uh, electronic method. But essentially everything has to be documented, it has to be monitored, and if any changes occur, that has to be documented also. Uh, intermediate systems, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, uh, if you, if when they identify if you use an intermediate system, uh, and especially where you've got like, the reason they do this, so you've got a high impact cyber system and it has a serial port coming out of it, which isn't a routable protocol, but it's going into a serial converter or a device that does have a routable protocol, then you've got that, that becomes an intermediate system, right? And essentially what NERC SIP is telling everybody is that, that you the, what you have to do is, is document where those intermediate systems are, and then, uh, you know, and, and like you see at the top, it's, you know, example of the evidence would be, uh, uh, network diagram or architecture documents, but essentially those have to be documented and uh, identified how they work, you know, what kind of protections in place for them, et cetera, et cetera, right? And uh, uh, you can see in the second one in 2.2 uh, for high impact and for for high impact systems, regardless of whether it's external routable connectivity, and for medium impact systems that use external routable connectivity. And it says, for all interactive remote access sessions, utilize encryption that terminates at an inter intermediate system. So what basically what they're telling uh, Power Utilities in version 5 is that, that when you have an interactive remote access session, or basically you remotely access a high impact cyber system or a medium impact cyber system uh, via, via routable connectivity, then that, inter that connection has to be encrypted. So just kind of an idea of what, what they're talking about and, and some of the uh, requirements for uh, uh, encryption. And you get the, the, the next one in 2.3, they now talk about multi-factor multi authentication. So now, for those same systems, you have to be able to do uh, not just passwords, but also passwords, and, and it could be a fingerprint or a retina scan or what most likely would be like a radius number generator. So you would enter your password and then the random number that's coming up on a little key fob you have in your pocket and to access the system, but that has to be in place and uh, and it's called out in version 5. And so this kind of looks a little bit like what it is. Uh, I know it's kind of a busy, busy document, but if you uh, if you look at the top, uh, you'll see the electronic security perimeter uh, inside the ESP is a, uh, a high impact uh, PCS and a medium impact PCS. The yellow uh, oval in the middle is your electronic access point, so that's what you've identified as the access point to the uh, to the ESP. Below that, say, and then not inside, doesn't have to be inside technically the ESP, and remember the ESP is an imaginary line, but essentially this is the intermediate system, and it can be doing protocol breaks, so it's breaking that routable connectivity. Uh, it's doing multi-factor authentication. It's also logging every communications attempt and what's going on, and then obviously you'd have an authentication uh, 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 server, right? So 
this just give you kind of a visual of what it looks like and, and kind of hopefully it'll make a little more sense to you. Uh, <clears throat> modern cyber attacks and, uh, and the sense of security illusion, you know, this is one of the things that NERC pushes hard. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security does a, a whole presentation that lasts two hours on, on all the different uh, 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 stupid things that, that people do uh, when it comes to security. But essentially what, what, what NERC's trying to get across to people is that just because, you know, so if someone hacks your network and nothing bad happened, it doesn't mean that nothing bad's not going to happen, right? And probably the most important thing is that, uh, uh, you know, someone could hack into your network. A lot of times they're simply just trying to figure out how to get in. So they're trying to find the, the, the vulnerable route, right? So you may have detected it, but because nothing bad happened doesn't mean you're off the hook, right? So now, you know, that you, you've got to take steps. You also have to keep in mind, and you've got to go in and, and, and do uh, forensic analysis to make sure that that hack didn't, you know, wasn't somebody planning malware that's only going to, uh, that's going to manifest itself a year from now or six months from now, right? So, so that's one, one of the most important things that, uh, that NERC pushes is uh, uh, every time you detect an intrusion, that intrusion has to be documented, there has to be a plan in place, and there has to be a forensic investigation that takes place uh, to make sure that uh, you truly are still safe, right? Uh, man in the middle attacks a little bit about what those look like. So I mean, pretty typical. I mean, uh, you know, especially in, in, in today where we've got a lot of MPLS, uh, uh, especially MPLS public networks, but also even a lot of the people have deployed even utilities deployed MPLS core networks for for the core IT, which are kind of difficult uh, in a lot of cases to secure. But essentially, what happens is you know you send packets across the network. They go in the middle. Someone grabs them. Changes them, alter them, so you can see the blue the blue box going through. All of a sudden, it becomes a red box going, coming out. So this is a man in the middle attacking, and uh, essentially using carrier Ethernet and MaxSec, we can uh, uh, we can build a a one to one uh, security associated uh, uh, tunnel across that network, and essentially ensure that uh, uh, no one could uh, could tamper with that packet or replay the packet or or record them and you know uh, replay them at a later date. I mean that can occur using carrier Ethernet and specifically using MaxSec. Uh, encryption uh, again, encryption. Uh, uh, it's not just confidentiality. You know, encryption uh, has to be a one-to-one -one trusted tunnel between two points, specifically point A and point B. Uh, you know, and, and in a lot of cases there there could be dozens of network nodes and hundreds of miles of fiber and copper between point and AB. But what, what you need to build is basically that trusted tunnel, then only point A, only point B are important, right? And so uh, uh, using MaxSec and IPSec, you know, it's capable of doing that. Uh, and I know we're running, I'm probably running a little long here, but uh, uh, I promise you we're getting pretty close to the end. Uh, MaxSec versus IPSec, and I, I told you earlier I'd kind of tell you what the difference. They both basically do the same thing. Uh, when it comes to authentication and encryption. Uh, the difference is MaxSec is layer 2 based, IPSec is layer 3 based. Uh, IPSec has roughly about 40% uh, bandwidth overhead. MaxSec is way, way less. And so depending on how you, how you, uh, how you deploy MaxSec, in our case, uh, uh, we had about 8 microseconds of additional delay when we're encrypting an entire 1 gigabit payload. Uh, whereas IPsec, you know, that could add, you know, another 10 or 15 milliseconds. So, essentially, in a lot of cases, 10 or 15 milliseconds don't really matter. Uh, but when it comes to teleprotection, where latency is really important, it does. So we use MaxSec specifically because we want to support teleprotection in our our megaplex uh, multi-service access multiplexer. And then give you this kind of a little quick look of what uh, uh, a MaxSec tunnel would look like. But essentially, uh, the red line depicts the tunnel from end to, from end, to end. But basically, the, the security uh, association is done between the two nodes on each end, and uh, everything in between uh, uh, <coughs> everything in between becomes unconsequential, right? Uh, and then, of course, obviously, we can do MaxSec uh, tunnels within uh, a carrier Ethernet ring. The center ring could be carrier Ethernet. Uh, in this case, it's shown as a 
G.8032, which would be carried, but it could also be an MPLS uh, uh, ring or network or a SONNET uh, network. <coughs> Excuse me. But essentially what NERC sec says is that you have to provide documentation <coughs> of the configuration of an interactive remote access for an ESP, and that documentation should describe how encryption is deployed for the interactive remote access session and the termination points of that encryption. So you have to be a little bit careful when you're doing encryption and ensure that you're that you're actually uh, uh, the the access and the or the the termination points where you actually know where the termination points are and they're not they're not node by node they're they're end to end uh, uh, and uh, and you can prove that with uh, by using the right technology and MaxSec is a technology that can allow you to do that. So what does uh, uh, what does Rad uh, what you know what do, what does our solution look like? I mean, in the top right hand corner uh, here, there's the Megaplex right inside the substation. You're going to have all these devices, uh, protection, uh, threshold protection uh, relays, overcurrent protection, uh, RTUs, uh, <coughs> power quality meters, etc. Right. So we provide firewalls that uh, that protect those devices. Uh, you can see the key pop up. We we provide encryption of all the communications coming in and out of the electronic security perimeter and electronic access point using MaxSec. Uh, we do network access control, and we do it specifically to the standard of 802.1x. Uh, we can do that over uh, uh, a carrier Ethernet, a SONNET, or an IP MPLS backbone. And then we provide the network management software and the tools to do logging, uh, specifically syslogging and network access control. Uh, setting, setting up the tunnels, you know, building these secure point-to-point uh, -point connections and encrypted connections, et cetera, right? So what we try to do is provide an end-to-end -end solution uh, that uh, uh, <clears throat> that meets, that helps, a, helps enable a utility to become NERCSIP compliant. You know, that's kind of one of the things I really haven't said today, but I like to say a lot is that <clears throat> anytime you see anybody say their product's NERCSIP compliant, beware. It's very difficult. I mean, I'm not even sure how you could determine if you were NERC SIP compliant. I mean, it's such a it's such a wide ranging document with so much other stuff. What we like to say is that we provide provide products and and uh, and systems that help enable utilities uh, to be NERC SIP compliant. Again, kind of summarize it, and I, I, I tell you, I'll thank you guys uh, uh, for your time. Uh, I hope I didn't bore anybody terribly, but essentially, uh, NERC SIP, uh, the critical infra infrastructure protection. Uh, document, documents require utilities to define BROs, which are the reliability operating service, uh, BCAs, which are cyber as assets, and also BCSs, cyber systems, uh, ESPs, electronic security perimeters, and uh, EAPs, electronic access points, all have to be defined and documented. Uh, they call out specifically using distributed firewalls uh, for electronic security perimeters, uh, elect encryption. Uh, uh, and especially encryption if it's going over lease services or private IP MPLS backhaul networks that are hard to secure uh, has to be a, a, a used for interactive remote access. You have to log everything. I mean, seriously, that's one of the things that very, NERC's very, very uh, uh, picky on is that everything is logged and documented. And then, uh, you know, worldwide, I mean, people are people want to attack both our countries, right? So it's a uh, uh, whether we're whether you're an American or a Canadian, we all know how uh, you know people people want to attack us, right? So uh, securing our infrastructure is very important. And guys, that's you know I will read these to you. You can kind of read them for yourself, but these are kind of some of the key takeaways. And uh, I appreciate you uh, uh, you know listening to me today and uh, taking time out of your day. And if you need to get in touch with me, my email is at the bottom. Or you can uh, contact uh, uh, the friendly folks here, our friendly hosts, and uh, I'm sure they'll be glad to get you in touch with us. But uh, feel free to reach out to me and uh, if you've got any questions. That's it. Thank you, Dave. That was a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, I don't see any questions that have been submitted. Uh, if anyone does have any questions, you can you can put them in right now. Um, otherwise, forever uh, hold your peace. <laughs> Send an email afterwards. 
Um, if you do, if you, if anyone out there does think of any questions, I know that it was so comprehensive. That maybe there aren't any. Um, you can always send an email to me. You would have received an email from from me, Lisa. So feel free to send an email. Um, thanks to Dave. Thanks to Cody. And um, keep an eye on email. I will be sending out a link to the presentation, and you can share it with anybody. It's going to be a, a video file. Um, also, if anyone would like a copy of the PowerPoint, if Dave is willing to share it, um, you can just note that in your email. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, have a great day. We'll talk Bye. to you soon.